All right, let's get started. Hello, Florida State University College of Law. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. So if you already know what CALI is, then uh, I hope to go a little bit deeper. And if you don't know what CALI is, I'm gonna give you a very quick 20, 25 minute talk about some of our major projects and why I think it's important or useful for law students to know about what we do. Let me get my slides going here. The title of my presentation, Cali, your national strategic stockpile for online legal education and access to justice. All right, let's get started. So too long, didn't read. Cali is a 38 year old nonprofit. We were incorporated way back in 1982. Actually had our roots earlier than that. So we're, we're over 40 years old. And we have an enormous amount of useful materials for law students and for law faculty. I'm gonna dive into legal, into Cali lessons, which is what we are most popularly known for. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our free case books. Yes, free, as in you don't have to pay any money for them, but that's not the best thing about them. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about access to justice and a project that Cali's been working on for oh, 15 years and why this is relevant for legal education and why this is a win, win, win. All right, first of all, the TLDR. Well, if you haven't registered at the Cali website, you should do so, www.cali.org. You need an authorization code, which your law library can provide. And by the way, I wanna thank the law library for inviting me for this talk. Um, you should follow us on Twitter, if you're one of those Twitter people, at Cali.org, or myself, at John P. Mayer. Um, and if you haven't run any of our lessons at all, may I suggest that you start at a, a group of lessons called Law School Success. These are lessons written by academic success people, academic support people, and they're intended, they're, they're not on a specific legal topic, they're intended to help you be better law students. So check those out. Uh, there's over a thousand interactive tutorials that we have written that teach the law in small, specific, rigorous steps. They take about 20 to 40 minutes to run, and I'll go deeper into that in a second. You can use the lessons to figure out how well you are doing. They're a formative assessment. They tell you if your knowledge is clear and, and complete on a particular topic area. And uh, of course, we are now trying to become more well known for our free and open case books and textbooks that you can download and read for free in a multitude of formats. Again, I'll deeper dive into that in a little bit. So let's dive into a Cali lesson. So the Cali lessons teach you the law. They're interactive, they're online, they're self-paced. They're not easy, right? They're, they're rigorous. They ask, they ask hard questions and you have to think before you answer. But key to this is they don't hide the ball, right? They give you feedback, they give you the answer so that you can tell if you got the, right, if you got the answer right for the right reason. They're all written by tenured law faculty, or in some cases, law librarians, and they're reviewed by other law faculty. So we have very rigorous standards for quality, and we keep them up to date. They are not flashcards, right? We don't do flashcards. There's lots of other excellent flashcard materials out there. They're not uh, canned outlines. They're not videos that you watch. They're not passive. Each, to each lesson typically covers a very narrow and a specific area of law. It requires 20 to 40 minutes, all right? So it looks something like this. This is me opening up a Cali lesson. It starts with a hypothetical. So a couple of paragraphs or sentences that you have to read to get the, to get the picture. And then the question, and then the lesson peppers you with questions in which you have to choose the answer. And if you get the right answer, you get feedback. But also if you get the wrong answer, you get feedback as to why the answer was right or wrong. All right, so a lesson is a collection of these hypotheticals with a collection of questions around those hypotheticals, maybe changing the facts, and they may branch. So if you get an easy question wrong, it may branch to a more remedial side of the lesson. If you get a hard question right, it may pepper you to see if you got the answer correct, correct for the correct reasons, right? It's not good enough to just guess. It keeps score so that you know it's, a, it's intended as a motivator, not as a grade, you know, so that you, if you, and on subsequent runs of the lessons, you can see if you do better, all right? 
So there's lots and lots of lessons, but I want to focus, you know, uh, there's lessons on in 1L topic areas and 2L and 3L topic areas, as well as the law school success lessons, which is the ones I want to sort of highlight here. All right. So the law school success lessons are a collection of lessons written by law school success people, our academic support. Sometimes they're called academic success. Sometimes it's your bar prep person, right? They're meta lessons. They're about how to learn or how to study in law school. So as you can see from these titles, attacking exams, case briefing, common law basics, um, they're aimed at 1Ls especially. But frankly, if you're, if you're a 2L or 3L and you need a brush up or your study skills aren't up to par, this would be a good place to, uh, to improve them. All right, more screenshots of the law school success lessons. Our lesson viewer runs in a browser, it should work in almost any browser, uh, as well as on your uh, smartphone, um, so mobile friendly. Also, uh, WCAG 2.2 compliant. If you don't know what WCAG is, it stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. That's a acronym for, uh, for, for, for the technical side of Americans with Disabilities Act's compliance. We've done a lot of work on our, on behind the scenes on our software to make them useful for people with uh, uh, disabilities. There's over a thousand lessons in 40 different subject areas written by law faculty, as I said. We pay the authors to write them and we pay the reviewers to review them. And that's the way we get things you know, done. Some of the reviews are anonymous, so because so people are harsh on our authors, and some of them are non-anonymous. Um, in other words, they're more collegiate or or collaborative. Um, and there's a button in in the viewer, the lesson viewer, in which students can send us feedback, and students do a lot. Um, uh, we take that feedback seriously, and we use that to improve the language or the flow of lessons as we go. Our lessons have been used over 10 million times. In the last uh, decade, they get a lot of use, especially right before exams. But I should say that you're better off if you start running Cali lessons early in the semester so that you build up knowledge as you get closer to the final exam. Now, this is of more interest to faculty, but I wanted to let students also know that it exists. Fa if the faculty have a way to create a link to a lesson, it's called a lesson link, in which if the student follows it, then the faculty can see your score. Otherwise, if you just go to the Cali website and run lessons, student faculty can't see your scores. Nobody can see your scores, just you. We take privacy seriously. But if they follow, if they follow, if you follow a lesson link to a lesson, the faculty can see the students and they can see which ones in aggregate are having trouble in a particular subject area. We call that, or it's called formative assessment. And the idea behind formative assessment is to inform both the student I'm not doing so well, I better study this area. Or the instructor, my students are having trouble in this area, maybe I better cover this material again. All right, they also get a view of a lesson by question, so they could see which questions everybody got right, that would be the ones with 100% green, or they could see which questions in which more than 50% of the class did poorly on. Um, and that might also be another indicator. So one of our goals at Cali is what we call agency. We wanna give students the agency to learn in the, in the way that they want to learn. And we wanna give faculty the agency or the tools to be able to find out how well their teaching is going and how well their students are going. It's a big deal with us, agency. There's another version of this. You may or may not run across it. It depends on if your faculty member does this. It's called Lesson Live. And what it means is they could run the lesson in the classroom or on Zoom and you would then run the same lesson following the same link. And there's a big button, that lesson live button right there. And if you click it, it takes you, it transports you to the same screen that the instructor is on. And then as you answer the question, or as everybody in the class answers the question, the instructor gets to see who answered, you know, who chose which question. It's kind of like uh, poll anywhere or polling inside of Zoom, except it's built right into a Cali lesson. So it's polling plus Cali lessons. Um, and more and more faculty are starting to experiment with this. And it's kind of a neat way to break up the monotony of a lecture or to create interactivity inside the classroom using the substantive uh, information, the content inside of a Cali lesson. All right, that's the first third. I'm gonna pause for a moment and go to a virtual background interlude. 
Uh, let me show you one of my favorite uh, Zoom backgrounds. So take a moment to load up. Let me find it there. All right, there it is. And if I hide myself here, this is Chonk. What I like to do is to come into Zoom meetings and just uh, leave Chonk, the woodchuck, uh, sitting there uh, eating his broccoli. The story behind this, this is a, a video I found, is that this guy has one of those wildlife cameras. And the wildlife cameras has like a little, has a little glass uh, uh, covering over the camera lens. And the woodchuck likes to walk up to the camera because he can see himself uh, while he's eating. And so that's the, that's the thinking is that the woodchuck is like, uh, is watching another woodchuck eating. So he has some company while he's doing that. So if you want this Zoom background, email me, jmayer at cali.org and I'll send it to you, all right? Anyhow, this has been a virtual Zoom interview. Let me come back to the slides and let's go on. All right, unfortunately, when I reload the slides, it takes me right back to the beginning. So I got to click through all the way to the next section, which is free case books. Yes, but that's not the best thing about them. So we do free case books. We pay faculty to write case books and then we pay them all the money up front. So they don't get any royalty. We don't sell the book because we give it away for free under a Creative Commons license. We've got about 30 or 40 books at this point by some fantastic authors. John Witt at Yale wrote a torts book for us. Um, and, and here's the key thing. You can download the, the book as a PDF. Yeah. All right. You can also download the EPUB or the Kindle version, you know, for your ebook reader. Eh, great. But you could also download the Microsoft Word version of the book. And I'm going to explain why that is like a superpower of, of this project. Finally, you could buy a print version of the book and quite cheaply. We, we set it up with a print on demand service called lulu.com where they don't add any additional cost if we don't try to get any profit. And we don't, and so they don't. And so the, the, pro, the cost of the print books is, is, is quite ridiculously low. So let me go into why I think open eBooks is a big deal for law students. And, um, and, and I think your generation is in that transition space where some of you are going to totally get this and be okay with it. But, you know, if you're old like me, then you still like the interface that the paper book provides. Um, but I think in the future, it's going to be all, all eBooks. Uh, the number one thing, and we did this survey, was we found out that students love eBooks because they don't weigh anything, right? They, you don't have to haul these 50 pounds of books around. Now, not, not such a big deal when you're stuck at home uh, taking Zoom classes, but, you know, back when, when we get back into the classroom, you know, hauling books around will be, again be another issue. Second, it's hard to lose an electronic book, which is to say, if you do lose the electronic book, at least ours, you can always go and re-download it for, for free. Um, there's no, no, no way to uh, lose it and, uh, you know, and have to buy another copy. Third, you can search it. Right. If it's uh, if it's the PDF version, you can at least hit Control F, you know, and find the thing. Um, you know, you could do uh, there's other tools inside of Word that that let you search through a, a large document, you know, much faster than you can flipping through an index or something like that. Fourth, you can highlight it. Now you can highlight a paper book, sure, but you can highlight an ebook, at least in Word, multiple ways. Right. You can make the, you can you can create a new style, you can type things as comments in the margins, you can change the color of the text, you can change the font, you can make it bigger or smaller. There's all sorts of capabilities when you have the, the source code of the book at your, at, uh, available to you. Uh, fourth, or the next thing is um, you could form study groups. So you could copy chapters up into Google Docs and then you could have the study group read through the chapter each person taking their own notes. And so you could share notes easily along with the text of the book anytime you want. Sometimes in the uh, digital rights management books, that's impossible to do because they don't want you to copy the book out of their system because then you could share it around and they would lose sales. I uh, hope you're starting to see the reason why we're in this business, right? The other thing is if you've got an online study group in Google Docs or something like that, you can invite the instructor in. This is Professor Ruth Ann Robson. She's uh, the author of a couple of our books at uh, CUNY in New York. And, um, you know, she could be like a sort of like a, a godlike figure hovering over your notes and, and seeing whether you're, whether you're 
your your notes are uh, are accurate or not uh, if 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 she so wanted to do so right uh, you could use text to speech software of which there's a lot of it available for free and you could take the the, the text of the book and then turn it into a podcast then you could listen to it while you're walking the dog or running on the treadmill or something like that um, of course, if you want a print version, and I understand that, it's a better interface for some people, sure, fine, you can buy the print version. And there are studies that say that it's better to learn, you, you can learn better from reading the paper book. I, I think it's a highly personal choice and I wanna give people the agency to make that decision. So for instance, this Judicial Ethics and Conduct book by Steve Berenson is $6.86. All right, it's a 182 page book. John, it's just a small book, but here's a bigger book. Uh, Liberty, Quality, Due Process. This is one of Ruth Ann Robson's books. Notice it's 600 pages, the price is $12. Now you got shipping on top of that, five or six bucks by USPS. Um, so still under $20 for a, seven, a nearly 700 page case book. That's as cheap as we can get it and, and that's pretty darn good. All right, now it's not about the money. The money, the, the goal for this project is that we give freedom to the students to construct their own educational environment. And even more importantly, we give freedom to the faculty for when they assign these books, that they can do what they want to construct the syllabus or construct the materials for them. Um, so why is this good for law faculty? Well, we think it's, it's, it has to do with open source and creative commons, right? And that PDF is not good enough because you can't do some of the things I just described. You can't, or it's harder to do some of the things I described if all you have is a PDF. And that's why we allow for the Microsoft Word download, all right? But a faculty member could take uh, an existing book of ours and they could edit it down if they're not teaching certain chapters, they could delete them out, um, especially if they're teaching a shorter course. If they wanted to teach something from multiple books of ours, where if this was a situation where you had to purchase the books then you'd have to buy multiple $200 books. With us, you could take two of our books and then pull the chapters or take three of our books and pull the chapters any way you want. You could put in links out to YouTube videos or put links out to uh, uh, the law on government websites or, or the LII or something like that. The faculty could add their own commentary. So even if they disagreed with the, with, with the author of the book, they could have you read it and then they could say, well, I have a different take on this and here's how I think about it. Um, they could reorder the material to fit their syllabus any way they want. Again, all this is about giving the faculty agency to make the best possible educational tool for you, the students. And a key point here, because we use a Creative Commons license, is they can do all this without having to ask special permission. They can just do it. They don't have to say, oh, I got to get, I got to clear rights or something like that. We've already done that with the author. We've already paid the author for the copyright for just this reason. All right. So like I said, lots of books, materials, uh, law school material success is, is for students to uh, get better in law school. I suggest uh, you download that and take a look. Uh, uh, corporate income tax, First Amendment, bankruptcy law and practice, sources of American law. This is a very popular book in the legal research and legal, yeah, legal research courses. Quite a few of them have adopted that. All these are written by law faculty. They've been reviewed by other law faculty um, and they've been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. So uh, we must be doing something pretty good. All right, that's all I've got to say about casebooks. Time for another Zoom virtual background interlude. This one is also, this, one, this is one of my, this is my second favorite one after Chunk, the woodchuck. Let me find it here. Yeah, here it is. All right, I'm gonna hide myself. So this of course is a baby hedgehog and sometimes when I'm stuck in long Zoom committee meetings or things like that, I'll throw this up um, so that people can, so that I can signal that I'm getting a little tired here and that I would like, like this hedgehog, I would, I would like to go to sleep. Anyhow, um, if you want me to send you this Zoom background, email me, jmayer at kelly.org, and I'll be happy to send it along to you. All right, the sleepy hedgehog, I love that. All right, back to sharing my screen. I'm back to my PowerPoint where I have to click all the way through. Is there an easier way to, nope, I don't see an easier way except to just Click all the way through to the next one. There I go, one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, there I was. All right, we're on our last one. 
Kelly and access to justice, why this is a win, win, win. And why am I telling students about access to justice, especially if you're one else? Glad you asked. All right. So first of all, I want to teach you a little bit about, the, about what's called the access to justice gap. I don't know if you knew this, but so uh, poor people can get free legal help, right? You've heard of it, legal aid. Legal aid is paid for by Congress. Congress gives a grant to uh, a nonprofit, a special nonprofit called the Legal Services Corporation. What you probably didn't know was that they don't fund enough legal aid lawyers for everybody, all right? There are actually, actually only 50% of the people who ask for legal aid and are, what's the word, eligible for it, get it. So fully 50% of the people can't even get in the door because there just aren't enough legal aid attorneys in the US right now, all right? It's actually worse than that, right? The number is closer to 80% because there are an enormous number of people who are slightly ineligible. In other words, they make too much money to be to qualify for legal aid, but they don't make enough money to afford a law firm or a lawyer. And so in some family courts, up to 90, 95% of the people, at least one side of the, uh, of the, of the situation uh, is a self-represented litigant, an SRL. You should learn that term, SRL, self-represented litigant. It's also someone called a pro se, uh, which is a Latin word for re represents themselves. But SRL is the one that we've been using in the, in the biz here to do this. So 80%, sometimes up to 80% of unmet civil legal needs. You know, on the criminal side, uh, the court will appoint you an attorney, right? That's what public defenders are for. And I'm not talking about that. That's another underfunded, in my opinion, situation. I'm talking about civil legal aid problems, divorce, eviction, expungement, things like that. So this is what LSC's appropriations look like for the last, ooh, what is this, 40 years, right? And what you can see is it's kind of a flat line, which is to say they used to make about $800 million. Now they get about $400 million, 385. But all of these have been, all of these have been, uh, what's the word, um, adjusted to today's dollars. So about the same amount of money has been going into legal aid for, for its entire existence. But that actually represents a decrease in the amount of legal aid. And the reason is because during that same time, the population of the United States has gone up by from, uh, here, I, I almost have to, I have to hide myself to show the bottom of this graph, you know, from 1970 when there was about 200 million to today when there's over 300 million people. And that's what that arrow up there is showing. Whoops, I got a point. That's what that arrow is showing up there. So it's actually like a 30% or 40% decrease in the amount of legal aid available for self-represented litigants. All right. So about 20 years ago, LSC, Legal Services Corporation, started a thing called the TIG grant, the Technology Initiative Grant Program, where they gave money to legal aid programs to, to come up with technology solutions. And I worked on a project with uh, Chicago Kent College of Law and the Institute of Design, in which we went out and we studied, we, we watched self-represented litigants going to court, and it was a horror show. It was a, they were, they would, they would go to the wrong courts, they would be in front of the wrong judges, they would fill out the wrong paperwork, they would fill out the paperwork incorrectly, they were, you know, told they were in the wrong place. It was, it was, a, it was a mess. Anyhow, from from this research study in 2000, they wrote a book called Access to Justice: Meeting the Needs. And from that, Cali took the initiative and got some grant money. And our singular focus was to automate court forms. We figured if we could help people find the right form and successfully fill out a form, then that would improve the situation for in a great many situations. Um, to sum this whole thing up, it's like forms are computer programs that are written by committees and run by the justice CPUs, the, the, the courts. Forms are the language that the courts and the system uses to communicate with each other and with the people that have to deal with the courts, right? So it's like a special language. So we came up with this tool called A to J Author, Access to Justice Author. It's intended, it was designed to be very easy for a self-represented litigant to to successfully complete a form. So it asks one question at a time. The, the, the progress bar is you getting closer and closer to the courthouse. There's an avatar there. And then later on, there's an avatar that represents the SRL. Um, 
suffice it to say, we studied this, we did user, user design testing with this, and it's been extremely successful, all right? The key, one of the keys to this was lawyers can be taught how to automate forms without a programmer having to do the work at their elbow. So we can teach you law students, so we can teach lawyers, even you no math, hate, hate coding lawyers, how to automate an interactive expert system like this, all right? It's our viewpoint that there are decision trees, salt, there are flowcharts all over the place in law, not just in SRLs, but in all sorts of areas of law, in intellectual property and in securities and regulations and things like that. And so that this would be also a neat tool to teach students about the sort of algorithmic structure of the law, right? Behind each one of these A to J author guided interviews is a flowchart. And it's up to the subject matter expert, the lawyer or the law student to sort of suss out that, that flowchart and how it will be presented to the self-represented litigants. So we offer, we offer uh, free authoring and hosting to anyone who's creating non-commercial guided interviews for self-represented litigants. So if you wanna do this for your law firm, there's commercial packages galore to do this. But if you're doing this for poor people, for self-represented litigants, we'll be happy to work with, with folks, all right? We've automated or we've helped automate over a thousand forms and they've been used over five, actually the number's over six million at this time been used over 6 million times. We're the biggest, we're the biggest player in this, in this space. There are many others who have come after us and that's great, but the more the merrier. Um, the SRLs uh, fill out uh, surveys and tell us that they love it. The program was easy to use and helpful. I had no idea what to do and needed help very bad. Very helpful, saved me thousands of dollars. Love to hear that. Um, I haven't been in family court over 15 years, so I was glad I was allowed to use a computer to process documents, saves time. That's exactly our goal, right? Save people time, have, have them come out with a successful result. So by using this in law schools, this is why Cali is doing it, Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. By using this in law schools, we know that law students can learn by automating uh, a legal process. You have to understand the law thoroughly before you can automate it. We think that this is going to be a, a, an increasingly 21st century practice skill. More and more of the way you practice will be using automated tools like this. We think this is a tech competency. You have to think of the law as a structured algorithm, as a chat bot, as an expert system. You know? And on top of it all, if we can, if we can convince some of you to, to work with, with us and some of the legal aid folks we work with, then maybe we can also help address the access to justice gap. So that's why it's a win for law students and schools. The schools support us in doing this. It's a win for legal aid in the courts. We work with both legal aid organizations and courts, and it's a win for self-representing litigants. That's what I meant before when I said win, win, win. We've taught courses or done demonstrations or done you know, uh, demos uh, in, in over 20 different schools. We're happy to work with any of uh, you guys uh, if you want to uh, call us in. Uh, of course, we'll do it remotely or Zoom. And we'll also give you a free accounts on a to jauthor.org. So that's my story. Uh, no more Zoom backgrounds. Remember, if you're interested in Chunk or the Sleeping Hedgehog, email me, jmayer at cali.org. Cali's a small operation. There's only 11 of us. We are a nonprofit and we've been around since 1982 and we take that nonprofit stuff seriously. So when it comes to making decisions about whether something is uh, going to make us money or it's going to be better for education, we choose the education path. Almost all law schools uh, in the U.S. are members, 108, 98 of them, including Florida State. Thanks, folks. Go Seminoles. Um, and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much for your time and take care. Bye-bye.